Welcome to the very first episode of Breaking the Mold. This is a brand new podcast from Action Funder. Here at Action Funder, we work with businesses and non-profit leaders. We help the two to work together to create measurable change. In this podcast, we're going to introduce you to some of the change makers we know and admire. They'll be coming to us from boardrooms and community centers across the country. Get ready to hear about what challenges and drives these people who are dedicated to taking action on the issues that matter. I'm your host, Lorna, and this month I'm excited to introduce you to Linda. Linda's the Director of Brand Communications and Impact at one of the UK's largest construction companies, Sir Robert McAlpine. Linda has built corporate partnerships with the likes of the Global Paralympic Games, the famous influencer and advocate, Mother Pucker, as well as grassroots projects that have moved some of Linda's colleagues to tears. We talk about all of these partnerships, as well as Linda's passion for driving forward the mental health agenda and how a company like Sir Robert McAlpine can drive purpose alongside profit. So, let's get into it. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the Action Funder podcast, Linda. Thank you, Lorna. It's great to be here. Um, I'm excited. I'm really excited to have the chance to be talking with you today because there are so many great examples of positive impact initiatives that you're running at from McAlpine. And I really feel like every time we speak, I come away really excited by the potential for businesses to drive positive change. Um, yeah. So... First up, I'm going to dive straight in and ask if you could tell us a bit about Sir Robert McAlpine and, and your role there. Okay, well, yeah, sure. Well, I love talking about Sir Robert McAlpine, so I'm happy to do that, but I will keep it brief because um, then we can get into the, the real gritty about social impact and social value. But um, Sir Robert McAlpine is a family-owned construction engineering business. It was started over 150 years ago. Um, by a hardworking Scottish lad who borrowed some money from a butcher to build a chimney to try and better his fortunes. And the story goes on from there. And it's now, you know, we're a huge national tier one contractor and we build things like you'll have seen the work done on Elizabeth Tower, more commonly known as Big Ben or building the O2 Arena. So those sorts of projects. Um, my role there is I'm a director and I'm in charge of marketing communications, brand and social impact. So it's a really exciting and well-rounded role. I get to talk about the amazing things that our people do, the projects that they build, you know, things I could never dream or contemplate doing, but I get the, the pleasure of talking about them and sharing those stories with the world, really. So, yeah, it's, it's a really exciting place to work. And if you'd have told me... um. 10, 15 years ago, I'd be working in construction. I'd have thought you were mad. And now I just, I couldn't imagine not doing it. That's brilliant. Um, sometimes our careers take swerves that are unexpected. Yeah, um, but totally. it sounds from chatting with you, like you may have always had a drive for positive impact or, or business for mm. business for good. Is that the case? Have you have always been driven by making change? I'm driven by injustice and inequality makes me cross and I'm not a very cross person, but that's one thing that it, it will grate and anger me really, really quickly. Um, so that's, I guess, transferred into my working life. And then the further on in your career you get, the more control I feel you've got around directing the things that you do and the impact that you have. And so that's grown into it being actually part of my formal role, which you know, I, I never anticipated it being really, but I think it is something that's always been there. It's only become more formalised, I guess, in the past few years. Okay. And um, as, I, as I said at the top, there are so many different initiatives that you're running as part of your role. Um, and, and that role now being really uh, focused in on, on communicating, um, communicating what Sir Calpine does and, and impact as part of that. Um, can you can you talk a bit about one or a few examples of the of the impact campaigns that you're proud of mm. running at, at SRM? I'm particularly proud of um a lots of the campaigns that we do in this area but from we've got some that are really small some community grants through to big corporate partnerships so I mean some of the higher end big ones that I'm particularly proud of is that, um I was a 
a really big part and my team were a really big part of working with um, Mother Pucker and a White House on um, flexible working campaign and trying to change flexible working rights for people across the UK. And that just happens to mean that we've then been able to have an impact on um, flexible working rights for our own people across sites. And the driver for that really is mental health and helping the suicide rate in construction, because that is it's heartbreaking. It's really heartbreaking the amount of men who are taking their own lives. So if something like flexible working can help in that area, then I'm really proud to be able to do that. But then also um, I'm responsible for bringing in our big corporate partnership with the British Paralympic Association. Um, and I think, you know, it's very easy for companies to pay a lot of money to somebody doing good and then use their logo and it not really meaning much. And that's not what our partnership with the British Paralympics is. It's very much based on our values aligned. And so we work together as a team to say, okay, so we want to work with you. How can we have the most impact on our own people and employee engagement, but also on championing improvements in disability rights through promoting the amazing um, sports personalities that we have in the British Paralympic team. So at the higher end of the kind of um I guess corporate scale they're the two that I'm really proud of but the ones that <laughs> the ones that um the ones that choke me up and give me the most I guess daily joy and top up my well of resilience so that we can keep going on are the community grants that we offer across our projects you know I mean you know Lorna and I, I'm sure we'll talk about them but the impact of seeing our people be able to set up community grants and then pick the small organizations that are going to benefit from that amount of money whether it be three or five thousand pound and then having a real connection with those community groups I mean that's lovely that's a lovely day's work really you know they're the ones that get me that's when work doesn't feel like work came eh? yeah for sure that's for sure Brilliant. And how do you choose the nonprofits that you partner with, whether it's the large scale nonprofits that you've mentioned um, or activists or the, the small grassroots? I know you said that the uh, team is involved in selection sometimes, um, but do you have any kind of overriding uh, values that yeah. you put to the selection process? Yeah, and we do. We have it. We have, I guess, a tiered approach at different levels through the business, which sounds really formal. And we've only really got, I guess, kind of organised about it in the last couple of years. Um, but we have a charitable giving committee, which is led by our chair, Ed McAlpine. And, um, you know, we have a set of terms of reference of how we would pick our charitable um, corporate partnerships. So people like Maggie's Cancer Trust that we work with and um, the Construction Youth Trust um, and but the key driver in this most simple terms is do their values align with our values and can we make a difference? So I won't name them, but I'll give an example. One absolutely massive national charity were championing um, a cause that is very dear to the hearts of the construction industry and we really wanted to work with them. And so we spent some time developing that relationship and seeing how it could go. And there was nothing there, Lorna. It was like, you give us this amount of money, you can use our logo. There was nothing, you know, and, I, I, and it was there was no depth to it. So so our people wouldn't have felt any impact or felt like that we were really making a difference or a change. And actually, I'm not sure we would have been. We would have just been giving money and having no idea where it went. And so for us, it has to feel real and feel powerful. Otherwise, what's the point? You know, anyone can can pay money. But where does it go? I think that's what's important. And that's why I think it's the smaller local grants that have the biggest pack a biggest punch really and talking of making it real and powerful can you give some examples of those smaller smaller projects and organizations that you've supported that really stick in your mind yeah yeah I can I mean I was really lucky to be involved with the first sort of tranche of um, strong foundations grants that we we gave out as a business so they were all across the UK and they were kind of smaller pots of money that were different regions that we were you know building construction projects in that we wanted to make a positive difference in um, and so we had the pot of money and then we pulled together a, a kind of a, a judging panel that was made up sometimes of some clients or some key stakeholders in that region members of our team who were living or working there that wanted to um, wanted to help and we've we've made this a very voluntary thing so you know if this is something you're interested in you put your hand up I think that's the best best thing that we could do really um, and then we were able to pick um, 
local people that had obviously put forward for the grants and put forward for the money and there was a uh, there's a few of them that stick out for me and I, I'll never forget seeing quite a few um quite gruff um quite gruff construction individuals brought to tears by some of their application videos I think that was it, it was a really cool moment to see how moved some people were but for example there was a um there was a group of guys who were doing haircuts for homeless which I just thought was unreal you know they were barbers but they were they were looking for funding so that they could continue going around and helping homeless people you know keep on top of their hair hygiene make sure that they had a, a smart or haircut that they were happy with give them a bit of TLC and I thought that that you know it, it doesn't feel like a massive you know we're going to climb Kilimanjaro and and help these people get over some terminal illness you know which which is great too it was really literally on the street and not forgetting everyone in our society and giving people a little bit of dignity and a little bit of care and physical you know attention and I, that really blew me away as does the work of people like you know Oxford Food Share who are a food bank in Oxford where people I think believe it's really affluent and there's tons of money and that's you know that's often and unfortunately not the case in many areas and the work they do is really really powerful and with volunteers just getting out and making sure that people have got the food they need to be able to get up and carry on the next day so yeah it's it's yeah it blows my mind a little bit what people do with their lives I can really hear that coming through the I know you're making your, me a little bit tone. emotional today Laura I'm trying to keep it together <laughs> great bring it bring the emotion um <laughs> And it's it's so satisfying to be able to talk with emotion about what has already been achieved, right? Mm -hmm. um, but no doubt there are there have been hurdles on the way to getting to a place where you can partner with these organisations and support them. Mm -hmm. um, how can you can you speak to some of those hurdles, some of the challenges you faced? Yeah, and you know I'll never be anything but completely authentic about it it's exhausting it's really hard it actually if I'm completely honest it's sometimes really hard to just do a good thing when things feel like common sense and especially to me when I think well this makes complete sense why wouldn't we do this it isn't that you then stand in front of everyone and they all go yes okay you know most people are either oh it sounds like a good idea but have we really got time for it or, or there's a crisis I'm trying to deal with and that's not completely urgent so can we do it next week can we do it next month can we do it in six months you know you're always fighting for it to be this work I think to be at the top of people's agenda because everybody likes it and everybody wants to do it but when it comes down to it I found that it very easily falls down the priorities list and so to retain the amount of energy and resilience that you need to keep being you know tenacious about it to get it back on people's agenda and get it done and get it through you'll know this this is your life Lorna isn't it you know it's exhausting and I think you know we spoke about emotion before I think I'm a pretty resilient and tough character but I am empathetic which is why this work really matters to me so I think it can really take its toll on people working in this industry when you have to keep fighting for what seems like such common sense and so I found that a real challenge and a hurdle for myself and for other people working in this area and you know we've countered it by making sure that we we get really business savvy about it we talk about the benefits we measure things we we prove you know the impact as you know in, in monetary terms or in you know social return on investment we we do all of that but it feels often much harder get traction in an area like this than it does in perhaps other areas of you know my professional career mm. and what makes it easier how I mean how do you top up the energy and resilience at moments when you think oh I have to write another yeah. report quantifying the <laughs> business bottom line benefits of this work and um yeah how, how do you how do you top up your energy and resilience yeah I think a, a couple of ways I guess is a, a, I like to kind of try and focus on the community of people that do this work too. I think that, you know, there's great support and power for one another in that. Um, also, looking back at some of the application videos that we've got for small grants over the years, in a branding role, I often, you know, I'm part of a team that sometimes makes those big swooshing, you know, professional promotional PR videos. And they're all very, you know, they're a bit like movie trailers and it's all very exciting. And we spend a fortune of time and effort making those. And then actually 
some of these grant application videos are people just on their phone walking around the community center that they're trying to get a bit of money for you introduce you they're not um professional they're authentic they're just genuine asks for help and this is what you'll be doing and honestly that yeah they're, they're way better than any brand and PR team could ever produce it's heart and content isn't it yeah, the, sure, the sure, real yeah. the real heart that you mentioned earlier uh, is so evident in those videos now um I'm going to swerve the conversation a little bit um okay. because I know that you think a lot about what it means to be a business that's a force for good and I want to dig into that by asking some some tricky questions okay. um I want you to know that this isn't about putting you on the spot. It's um, something that we do with every podcast guest because That's really, kind of to say. <laughs> <laughs> really, it's not about making your palms sweat. Um, it's about talking through some of those tricky areas of things like greenwashing and yeah. power dynamics in in uh, charity partnerships and things like that that are important to talk about, to inform and educate and support decision making while we all navigate this growing mm. area of impact for businesses mm. um so to set ourselves up I'd, I'd love to know a bit about what motivates Rob McAlpine um as an organization as a business to invest in positive impact yeah so I guess for us you know I, I mentioned before we're over 150 years old we're still owned by the same family we're in the fifth generation of that family and so they are very much in it for the long term we don't really consider things for quick wins you know that so the reason we invest is because they you know their their name carries on hopefully for another five ten generations and, and part of that legacy is the good that we did not just the buildings that we you know we don't want to just throw buildings up and then move on that's really that's not our bag other people can do that and I won't name them but our bag is you know building iconic things helping our purpose is proudly building Britain's future heritage so you know it's all about what do we leave behind and and that can come in the form of you know what impact are we leaving in a community you know did they were, were they you know appreciative of what we did when we were there beyond the building so it's a kind of purpose beyond profit and that runs through everything which and it's very it's a it's very different to other places I've been in the past where you know there's a kind of well we must do a bit of this this and this just to be seen as good it it, it permeates through and it's because of that family link and the longevity really okay and um do you think that um in terms of the conversation on on bottom line impact versus mm. it being the right thing to do do you think there's um validity to making both arguments or should we expect businesses to simply do the right thing without having to quantify no I you know what it wouldn't that be great but we wouldn't have the world we live in if everybody thought that way and businesses are businesses we are not a charity you know we're we're a commercial business and and the benefits of that are not um just to to you know to line a small amount of people's pockets is to provide really rewarding career paths for over 2000 people and and leave buildings that you know many hundreds of thousands and millions of people can use so th there is a commercial element that has to be considered and that's why I think you've got to think of both you know I would love to be able to to work in a world where everyone just did good for for uh, you know a really altruistic reason but you have to consider both you have to consider well we're a commercial business um, and I guess to me it says well we're a commercial business let's try and do the best we can along the way as well rather than just being really you know kind of narrow-minded and, and selfish in what you do there's an opportunity and there's a great um, there's a platform that being a, a successful commercial business gives you um that I think that does come down it just being the right thing to do you don't have to you could just put all the extra money in the bank couldn't you but um it will be short-sighted you know your, your employees will see through that eventually your the communities you work with the clients that you're trying to win will see through that so even though you say it sounds like just the right thing to do it has spin-off benefits in making the right decisions you know and so the savvy thing is to report them well and make sure that you've got them, you know, in evidenceable format. But um, yeah, it's not 
although it is the right thing to do it's not purely altruistic sure and you um you've mentioned the inherent purpose that Zoran yeah. McAlpine um sits with the the building of heritage and the provision of really satisfying careers and mm. um creating these buildings that are used and, and bring joy to so many millions of people and it's interesting to think about corporate giving as mm. a part of that purpose where where do you see corporate giving sitting uh, as as part of activating your values yeah I think it I mean it, it's driven by our values and I think it's a really important part of who we are I think that our people kind of when they join us they you know we've had a lot of people join us in the last five years certainly since I've been here based on the opinions and the stances we take on various social issues and the amounts of things that we give back and I think that um the the world of work is changing people are making decisions based on different things um and so corporate giving is very much part of that you know it has to align to our strategy we don't really do anything completely um left field we we consider things well and we make sure that corporate giving is um is aligned to the things that are important to us but that's all values led you know it's all you know are we doing good are we leaving a lasting legacy are we making the right honorable choice here and that will drive our corporate giving decisions brilliant now you've um you've mentioned a bit about mental health being a really key issue in in the construction yeah. sector um and you spoke to some of those partnerships there that that do support um the the team that's from McAlpine um but I'm interested to know what are some of the other major issues that that you do tackle whether it's mental health or flexible working or what what do you think are the the key issues in construction right now yeah so I, I mean I guess there's a there's a long list mental health is is huge especially because you know we're a predominantly male industry and the male suicide rates are heartbreaking just heartbreaking um flexibility you know construction is a very traditionally set up way of working and that isn't hasn't perhaps evolved in the same way as that society or families have so in my opinion there's a disconnect between the way societies would function in a healthy and um, well-being focused way and the way perhaps construction companies are set up and established so flexible working is one of the kind of levers to um, improving that and then also climate you know our the construction's role in the climate emergency is huge so you know being able to um tackle that and contribute positively to that is also an absolute major issue and then equality and diversity which sounds we talk about it so often now and you and I are talking on International Women's Day you know which is fabulous and congrats to you for being such a, an inspirational women to many Lorna but um equality is still a real challenge for the construction industry and we have um we have spoken about it a lot so I think people believe that there's been a significant improvement but um you know I was I was I try to be a really um upbeat kind of activist for equality but I I, I woke this morning on International Women's Day and thought you know I'm not going to see true equity for women in my working lifetime and actually will my two daughters probably not so although we're talking about issues like climate and equality and social um, mobility I think it's great that that's more conversational now and I think it's great that we're thinking about those major issues but are we seeing the pace of change that we need for all of this effort absolutely not so that for me is mm -hmm. the pace of change on those issues particularly and I'm sure there are many many more that people will be able to add is you know a big challenge and um in the construction sector um that there is generally importance placed on environmental and social value, mm. right? Um, in a way that you don't see so much in other sectors. It okay. seems that there's a real um, regulatory environment around construction yeah. um, that actually enforces, particularly around climate, um, actions that, that are positive. Do you feel like the, the sector as a whole is keeping up with regulation or, or pushing forward and and having um, a really proactive role in making the sector a positive, a positive influence? Mm. 
That is such a good question. So I think I, I, I want to say both, if I'm completely honest, because there are elements and projects and people that I talk to where, you know, the the social value requirements or regulations or climate requirements are, are, are the bare minimum. And then we build from there, which is, you know, as it should be. And I think that the the, the reason I want to say both is that sometimes those regulations can be really onerous from a, a you know, from lean project teams to be able to deliver and report against those. Um, and it can sometimes feel like quite a, quite a slog, but um, as an industry, I, I've only met people who want us to use the baseline that's set by regulations and do more, you know, in my competitors um, teams, in our team. So I think sometimes as an industry, we get quite a bad rep, but the intent is often, you know, really, really good. So I think that the regulations being there are helpful. They make sure that there's a, a really healthy baseline, although it can be sometimes a little bit onerous, um, but they should be really be seen as a springboard. You know, this is the, the least we can do. And then what can we do above and beyond that? Now, it's International Women's Day, as you mentioned. And oh. I'm interested to very briefly ask whether you think that there is um, a tendency for women to go into positive impact <laughs> and how we can encourage men to join us. <laughs> what an amazing <laughs> question and I wish I'd have wish I'd have seen that one before and put some effort into it because I could get a bit real here Lorna um yes so I, I mean there was a was it a lean in report or a, a PwC McKinsey one of the reports I will find it afterwards so they can go out with the podcast that said that women were picking up a, a, an extraordinary amount of what is termed as office housework which as a phrase does not help women in business anyway, but basically things around DDI, you know, equality, diversity, and inclusion, things around social impact, charitable giving tend to be lent into and picked up um, by more women than men. Now, I'm sure there are a million scientific reasons for this, but for me, from a pure novice's point of view, it feels like women can be more confident and lean into things that they feel particularly passionate about and don't question themselves about. I think that's why we see um, more women in this area. And I'm I'm here for it. You know, this is the future. The future of um, business is in climate. It's in social value. You know, these are things that are going to be critical in the next 10 years. So if women are leading into them now, women are going to be the leaders that we see in the next 10 years. And I'm here for that, Lorna. Um, how do we get more men involved? Hard work, slog and effort, if I'm completely honest. Um, I think we need to educate. I think we need to um, be relentless. I think we need to keep you know, trying to point out to men the benefits that they could bring to this um, movement and, and try and engage them proactively because um, it would be lovely for this to be a really equal and um, successful movement. But, um, yeah, I, I, know, I do think we've got a bit of a challenge there because we're, we're challenging. This isn't a traditional part of business and neither are women. <laughs> So maybe that's where the marriage comes. Mm, that's an interesting insight. Um, I could keep talking with you for such a long time, Linda. You're always so inspiring mm -hmm. on International Women's Day and every day of the year. Now, we do ask every podcast guest to give us something to take away that's an action. We like being action-oriented. It's in the name Action Funder. Okay. Um, so... I'd love just as we wrap up, as we come to the end of our, our time, um, I'd love to ask if there's one action that you could share um, for any professional who's listening to this um, on their commute, making their dinner, going on a run. Um, mm -hmm. what's, what's an action that they could take away to start implementing positive change in their organization mm -hmm. um it could be something big it could be something tiny um but yeah just just an action okay okay I'm gonna well just a practical one that I think's really helped me especially sometimes when I felt a bit overwhelmed with you know I feel passionate about this but how do I actually get started how do I even help and it's I'm, it's probably not an original idea I just can't remember where I stole it from and it helps me and I do it quite frequently is I find it helpful to take a moment you know have a bit of time by yourself and think about okay so what is something a cause that really really matters to me 
what's a cause that really, really matters to my organization? And what's a cause that really, really matters to a key stakeholder group? Perhaps it's your clients and try and find a synergy. If you can find one slight synergy between those three things, whether it be, you know, in that Venn diagram and think, right, okay, that's going to be my focus. I'm going to think about how do I make a positive impact minusculely or massively in that one area over a period of time. You know, you don't have to do it by next week. It could take you a year to bring together a piece of positive action around, say, climate um, and the impact on local communities or social poverty. You know, if you can at least agree that one thing, give yourself a long time table and you're set because you know it matters to you in your heart, you feel it, you know it makes sense in the head to your organisation and a key site stakeholder group it will give you a guiding purpose and you don't have to have the answer about what you will do about that but keep it in mind keep resonating on it keep thinking about it keep it in mind in all the meetings that you've got stick it on post-its around your desk I guarantee you at some point whether it's in six days or six months an opportunity will appear where you can make a difference and it will be because you've almost facilitated it happening and given yourself time and space to do so and Honestly, if we all did that, imagine how much positive impact we could have. So I hope everyone takes time to to find that thing and do it. Share domes and go at it with resilience. Absolutely. From the yeah. heart. That's yeah. um that's a brilliant, a brilliant action to take forward. And um it's been a really lovely conversation. Thank you so much, Linda, for for taking the time. Oh, no, it's an absolute treat to talk to you, Lorna. And thanks for all the action funder are doing. You know, I mean, we haven't talked about it today, but you know that it it absolutely came and, and revolutionized how we do give our give back socially at, at community group level and just made it so easy for us. And um, yeah, it's been a it's been a real joy. So thanks so much. Not at all. And I'll be sure to link to Zora McAlpine's Action Funder page um, yeah, yeah, on, on the show notes so that everybody can jump in there and, and click through a couple of videos and, and see some of the brilliant projects that are being supported in communities all over the UK. Um, oh, brilliant. Thank you, Lana. Great. Thanks so much, Linda. Speak to you soon. Take care. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for this episode of Breaking the Mould. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Be sure to tune in for the next episode with Tracy Lynch, the director of the Greggs Foundation, who talks with us about food poverty and about how doing good is part of the Greggs DNA. In the meantime, head over to the Action Funder website for more on how business leaders and nonprofits are working together to create change today. That's at www.actionfunder.org. Until next time, 